Good afternoon, everyone. It's Matt. In this new series, which I've submitted for consideration to the Public Broadcasting System of the United States and the BBC, we look at a class of entity that shares this space with us called Earth that's not the same spiritually. And we look for ways that this class, which I affectionately call the Minion class, distinguishes its, this, distinguishes its distinguishes itself as being different, and at least it can pronounce words. Now, what you're looking at is Grant's tomb, one of the most famous obnoxious odes to oneself post-mortem mausoleums you'll find anywhere in the world. Now, if you're driving or listening at work, there are going to be some pictures, but you don't need to see them. Okay, we're going to show different mausoleums. It's, we're just going to talk about the concept of what type of spiritual entity would have to keep making post-mortem odes and celebrations of itself. This is really screwed up. The topic is more important. I'm just going to show different pictures once in a while of different, uh, say, mausoleums or burial sites. The minions love to do this, and it's a giveaway that they're not the same as us. Don't take your eyes off the forklift. Don't drive it through a little old lady's car. You don't need... Okay, we're going to show mausoleum pictures. You've seen them before, right? You don't need to see it. Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, Woodlawn Cemetery, if anybody's interested in getting a plot, is known for this sort of thing. If you're trying to look up from your forklift, it's just a blurry picture of these mausoleums at Woodlawn. You don't need to see it. The premise is what type of entity, what type of spiritual degenerate would need to do this sort of thing post-mortem? That's after death to you and me. Odes to themselves, announcements, look at me, look how great I was in life. This is a sick behavior, ladies and gentlemen. Deep down, we know real spiritual beings. We don't even need to be remembered by anybody. We don't want to be remembered, maybe by our wife and kids, if something happens, our direct family or our dog, but we don't need this. A real spiritual being just, I mean, I, maybe it's never been proposed to you, and most of us don't have the sort of money that could get something like this done, but most of us just deep down, we've never been asked before, would say, I want no part of this. This is some sort of attachment or root to this world. Or maybe they recycle right back in Aleister Crowley bodies. Maybe about two years ago, I did a video with a similar theme, mostly talking about why people put these obelisks, these ancient Egyptian odes to Ra and Osiris, Osiris, and Horus obelisks over their gravestone. And is that some way an attachment to this world that kind of keeps people here? I don't, I'm not sure exactly the theories we floated. This is a different video talking about why the minion class goes overboard to try to do this because they, they're coming right back anyway, likely to play their continued role as minion, even with past life memories. So th this is a different type of video, but I want to just a little proviso, a little disclaimer here. Um, if you're thinking right now that, uh-oh, we buried Granny, uh, say, three or four or five years ago, and she has maybe not one of these, but some large structure, a really over-the-top gravestone, and right now you're considering, well, I never even thought about that. Do we need to dig her up? No, don't dig Granny up. Whatever, it's already been made. The die has already been cast. The cement on that stone has already been hardened. If she's recycled back into a body, she's already living somewhere now as a baby in Delhi, India. There's nothing you can do. Don't dig Granny up. You've seen Poltergeist, the movie. Don't let those types of scenes play out in your house. We don't move graves. We don't dig up Granny. This is a, this is a worry about yourself exercise. Do you even want a gravestone? Is who wants to be remembered at all? Matt, you have videos. They'll be on the internet for you. Uh, well, there's nothing I can do about that. They take the videos. They can do what they want with the videos. They Maybe the, the videos on YouTube will be out there for thousands of years. That is, that is n not... I, I'm posting a video so you can see it. I'll declare right now. If YouTube... I ask YouTube to take them all down the moment I depart this world. If they hang around for thousands of years, it's not an attachment to this world. There's nothing I can do about that. But in contrast, look what Potter Palmer did outside of Chicago. He owned stores and hotels and was a real estate magnate. Up until recently, I thought it was a real estate magnet, like with the North and South Pole. For 40-some years, I thought it was magnet. It's ma just, and most of you did too, magnate, M-A-G-N-A-T-E, means a very wealthy and powerful person. 
So at some point while he was alive, Potter Palmer had a conversation with his wife or family or his personal witch or his psychic or, and said, I love this world. I'm McLoving <laughs> this world. I want to announce to everybody that I love the world and I want to be part of it again, recycled back on, into a body and stay in the minion class for the next time. And maybe the next time I come through, they'll have the AI and magenta speed boats and all the things he didn't have when he sold his dry goods, whatever the hell that is in his stores, and became the equivalent of a billionaire in yesterday's dollars. Is this some sort of rooting to the world? Maybe it facilitates how quickly they can get back into a body. Who knows? From the perspective of real spiritual beings, the type of work we're doing, you know, you and I look at this sort of thing. This is sick. This is sick. Okay, maybe Granny has a little grave. If Granny has a little gravestone, it's not going to doom Granny, I don't think. Go over the grave today or tomorrow and say an affirmation over the grave. Do it. I don't know. Burn some sort of incense or sage over Granny's grave. It's, I think it's fine. It, but Granny didn't live her life the way these magnets, mag, sorry, magnates did. Now, did she? Matt, I think you're being a little hard on Potter Palmer. You didn't know him. He could be the greatest guy in the world. You just immediately classify him as a minion just because he's got a large grave site. A lar- you, that, you call that a large grave site? It's one half the size of the Parthenon, the Pentanon, or whatever that thing is in Greece. Okay, let's, maybe I'm being unjust. Let's take a retailing career. Potter Palmer founded a dry goods store, Potter Palmer & Company, on Lake Street in Chicago in 1852. Unlike many stores at the time, it focused on women and encouraged their patronage. Oh my, I'm, I'm starting to take this back. Palmer instituted a no-questions-asked return policy and allowed customers to take goods home to inspect them before purchasing. I really take this back. This was the first guy that allowed no-questions-asked returns. Pam, every week, she's got a pile of stuff to return. I say to Pam, why you buy it in the first place? It drives me nuts. I'm, I'm going to be up your way, Matt. You're going to be around? Yeah, I got a bunch of stuff to return to Sierra. Why you buy it in the first place? I've never returned anything in my entire life. They, the practice drives me crazy. Sorry. So uh, this, this is actually not a good thing. The no questions asked return policy. Okay, well, look, let's see. Maybe he lived humbly and it just shows otherwise in his grave site. Let's see how he lived. Oh, no. This is the Potter Mansion and how he lived. Matt, that's got to be wrong. That's got to be the Tower of London or something. No, this is Potter Palmer's mansion home outside of Chicago and how he lived. Oh, boy. Well, Matt, what'd you think? You think uh, he's going to have that sort of mausoleum grave site and when you go to check out his house, it's like the Shire where like Frodo Baggins lived under a hill or something? Yeah. Once a minion and showing its true nature, always a minion. Now, remember, if this becomes a series, we're going to be looking at least once a month at how the minions give themselves away as being a completely different spiritual entity than you are. Your series are a waste of time, McKinley. Oh, they, they are if I don't continue with them. Most of the series that I promised recently, like the philosophers, I'm continuing with. I'm much better than I used to be in this regard. But I'm not joking in terms of what I just said, if you're new here. It's not just a joke or a way to make ourselves feel better. It is extremely likely, if not guaranteed, that the minion class, like Melvin P. of the Belinda and Melvin P. Gates Foundation, is a different spiritual entity, as Tony described it, having a different relationship with its higher self. Now, we don't like the fact that it even has a higher self, and someday it could get to where you are, but it's game-addicted. We're not joking around. This is not some fun series. This is literally a way to see how this minion class is literally different than you are at the fundamental spiritual level. It's not a joke. Going one step farther, the shrines to themselves in the cemeteries or after death. Here's something that's even worse. A lot of rich people, whatever, maybe even your granny has some sort of big tombstone. But let's start with the worst case scenario of them all. If the Knotnilk itself builds a post-mortem shrine to you, 
uh-oh, it is a giveaway that you didn't do too good in life, which means you did exactly what the not milk wanted. See, they go hand in hand. What the heck are you saying, boy? I kind of understand, but you're using the worst example of all time here. Obviously, government and public funds were used to honor great men like Lincoln. What are you talking about? This is making you look like a real fool. No, I'm sorry. This is how this reality works. If you have a gigantic shrine from government funds or on government land, or even even if you have the key to the city from Las Vegas, you're not doing any good. You're doing exactly what Not Nilk wanted, and that's very, very bad. Is there anybody right now trying to get a Pootie Tang Award that wants to tell me about the Emancipation Proclamation and things that would lead to a constitutional amendment and freeing the slaves? Of, uh, I hear you. Yeah, they're all very good things, but that was the act of of the play or the part of the script that was meant to play out at that particular time period. You think it was all assigned or came from one man, and that man that served Not Nilk was so great <laughs> that even though Not Nilk's evil, they said, well, this guy was so good, Not Nilk doesn't want to do it. Fromers tried to warn you, but we're still going to do a, 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 a memorial for him. Give me a break. Now let's jump over to the most famous one of all, Grant's tomb. It also has the greatest joke morphed with a riddle of all time associated with any mausoleum or burial site anywhere in the world, which I guess I'll give you that riddle right now. Who's buried in Grant's tomb? Oh, you don't know, do you? Grant, no, not just, you don't just say Grant. He's not buried at all. It's a mausoleum. Aha, aha. He's above ground. I guess that's the trick. I had no idea where this was. Almost nobody has any idea where Grant's tomb is. I had no idea to look it up. I had no idea. Nobody knows. You could tap, don't actually tap, don't tap anybody on the street ever again. You tap somebody on the street, you go into jail for years, but the mass murder will get out tomorrow. Um, if you were to ask somebody politely where, where that's allowed by the Constitution, where is Grant's tomb? Nobody knows. It's way up high, Manhattan. It's way up. It's like, what is it, that Bobby Womack across 110th Street up there. But see, nobody goes up there because on the one side of Central Park is Harlem. You, you, did you see Do the Right Thing? Did you see Radio Rahim? Put some more mozzarella on that motherfucker. Nobody goes up there. No white person has ever seen Grant's tomb. No, the other side is, is different. But you get on the subway, you go the wrong place, you get out, and Mookie's standing there, you in trouble. The other side is Morningside Heights or whatever it's called. That's where Grant's tomb is. It's technically Manhattan. It's the Bobby Womack. I thought it was for years up on 110th Street. Could this be a Mandela effect? I didn't, I didn't have the Bobby Womack uh, vinyl collection here, but I thought it was up on, uh, across 110th Street. That's a hell of a song, by the way. I am not even joking. Go listen to that and some, uh, what was the other? Uh, Curtis Mayfield. Man, that's some good, sh some good shit. This is Inside Grant's Tomb. Very similar to looking up at the Capitol Dome, except he don't have no apotheosis up there. No idiot hung from the ceiling painting an apotheosis like George Washington has at the top of the Capitol building, where George Washington, as anybody would, as Bagger said, as they all do, pictured himself with Hades and Zeus and Athena and all the Greek and Roman gods are up there hanging out with George Washington. Why didn't they do the same for, for Grant then? See, here's a theory, because it ain't really Grant's tomb. It, that's some sort of a facade or ruse. It's a cunning attempt to trick us. Maybe it ain't Grant at all. Maybe it's one of the dark figures that is like really associated closely with what we call not milk. Maybe it's under the guise of Grant's tomb. See? Oh, see what? Oh, now what does your inner knowing tell you? They build all this shit for just some president that not many people know anything about. Ulysses S. Grant gets the biggest tomb mausoleum in the world. Or maybe, may, it's your inner knowing's coming out, isn't it? Like mine is, maybe it's for something else. That's what my little tuning fork tells me. I don't know why I just thought of this or how this is potentially related. I'll do my best here. For the few of you that watched the Queen's funeral, they, the body procession, but then they went inside. Remember, they had a formal a funeral service where Charles came in. That was what was that must have been what Dal Dalton Abbey, Dalton Abbey, where the, where the service was. The point is, it was extremely quick. I I just you know I had to watch it. I know just maybe five of you did. It seemed to be only I don't know. It seemed to be like forty five minutes. But the point I'm making here is, I got the sense that there were two funerals. 
one for the cameras, one in the Dalton Abbey. And then it was very quick and brief. And it was like, get you, mother, get out of here. All the press, all you regular proletariat and great unwash, you know, all you, all you guests. And then, then you, you almost got a sense like the real funeral took place. Maybe the, yeah, I hear you. Maybe it, the, the, it was lowered down into the pits and something underground took place. Certain strange scenes from the Da Vinci Code, <laughs> for example. The point is, what we saw on TV was the funeral service for the populace, for the peasants. I, I got the feeling there was another one. Things you wouldn't want to see and you couldn't unsee if you saw them. But I get that sense with Grant's tomb. I'm sorry. So get in touch with your inner knowing exercise, which I've been doing for a minute. And one thing has come in that I didn't really account for that I want to share with you guys. At first, my inner knowing inner tuning fork was like, there's just no way this sort of thing is done for, again, Ulysses S. Grant, a president that just, you know, middle of the road. People have heard of him. People on the street would be like, yeah, I heard of him. They don't know much. I mean, it's just, I'm sorry. It's like, it's like Calvin Coolidge. It's a middle of the road president. Um, so I'm like, there's something, something else <laughs> buried in here maybe. But, but my inner knowing is kind of screaming at me this, saying the death that was associated with the Civil War, the killing, the death, um, was so to not milk, so magnificent, so needs to be celebrated that the, if the character Grant saw to all that and basically the destruction of who knows countless, how many towns, cities, people, Sherman's March, whatever it, whatever it may be, whatever history you believe or not believe or somebody yelling, reset, reset, I don't want to hear any of that horse shit right now. Whatever the Civil War was, was just, was nasty on a lot of people, on millions of people, on huge parts of the South. Of course it was. Whatever you believe it to be. Reset, reset, shut up. Um, maybe, uh, my inner knowings kind of scream, Matt, it ain't, it ain't some dark figure buried in there. They're celebrating the, the death that somehow uh, Grant, in, in, during, in the bot, this is about the Civil War, was associated with. Yeah, the one that, one that brings the most death gets the biggest mausoleum of, uh, similar to the one of the great wonders of the world, of Harley Canassus. Maybe, maybe. Inner no one's trying to yell at me. Matt, it ain't, it, there ain't some alien, some Jared Kush, Kushner uncle bird in there. It's because of the death. That's what they're celebrating. Ooh, yeah, that that's becoming um, a, a bigger possibility or even a probability, whatever that means. Here's a picture from inside Grant's tomb. It says, under the eternal guard of his Civil War comrades in arms, together with his wife, I'll show you that picture of the mausoleum, they rest in peace. Well, this is inaccurate. Rest in peace. He would have already recycled back into a body. He could be anything two, two or three generations away. He could be Anderson Cooper right now. Think of it. He could be Warren Buffett. He could be Jack Nicholson. He's a... There, there, nobody's resting in peace. He's, he's been working for Not Milk uh, via various uh, more other generations. He's been back in a body for potentially over 100 years. This is totally wrong. Here it is. So it gives you chills looking at something like that. How romantic. I guess down in the belly of this place is the mausoleum section. You could do a, your own version of Romeo and Juliet. Two rotting corpses, both alike in dignity, in fair Grant's tomb where we lay our scene, where it's an extra five dollars to, to, to come down and see it. That's why nobody's there. <laughs> Nobody wants to pay the extra five dollar to come down and see this part. They went, Mom, Mommy, where's there? Is there a McDonald's built in here like the Franklin Institute? Where's the McDonald's built in the Grant's tomb? I want McDonald's. I want 20 piece chicken McNugget. That nobody's down here. I guess maybe they took it special for the picture. You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of the, the summer that I spent in the, um, what's that called? I must have said the Sistine Chapel. It's called the, the Taj, it's not the Sistine Chapel, it's the Taj Mahal. I spent a summer there. Like Bear spent a summer in the link, or wanted to spend a summer in the Lincoln bedroom of the White House if they pulled off their asteroid mission. And the, the Taj Mahal has similar his and her mausoleums. That's why that gigantic thing was built, of course. What were you thinking? You wouldn't think that the Wikipedia history is wrong or something. You're not one of those people. Oh, no, this is inside Grant's tomb. The theory about the root cause of massive death is gaining more credence. A celebration of Vicksburg? At this site, 
Why did they have at indented a little bit? Who made that printing error? At this site on the Mississippi River, Grant succeeded in cutting off and entrapping General John Pemberton's army at Vicksburg, resulting in the surrender of the city on the July 4th. Is that what we're celebrating? It's on this Union victory, and then it goes on, and it was cut off. I apologize for that. Above it looks like, what is it, a, a picture of Whistling Dick? Confederate Army Artillery, it says at Vicksburg. The artillery is called Whistling Dick. Look, Jeff, I went over to follow this breadcrumb, just j- checking out Vicksburg, because I'm not a Civil War historian. Look at the bottom right, the strength of each army. 77,000 against, oh no, there it is again, 33 thousand the 33 jeff just after following a few breadcrumbs the 33 popped up immediately like it does for jeff every single time vicksburg but what's going on folks is the reality itself sorry to, for the sidebar here um this is going to really freak out anybody that's new um reality never was that real but it is it is uh, as the years go by it, it's becoming uh its fabric is is um let's just say uh, unraveling like a sweater to, to a degree there it's a blending of what you would consider real from the past in the last century into the fake and the fake is winning the real pieces won't just go away overnight. It's Everything's being blended with the fake. So people wake up one morning, say 10 years from now, and they don't have any clue about anything. That's the point. Sorry for that minor sidebar about reality. That stuff's not important. Vicksburg was the last major Confederate stronghold on the Mississippi River. Therefore, capturing it completed the second part of the Northern strategy, the Anaconda Plan. Well, Anaconda Plan? That's a... Bad movie with Ice Cube, isn't it? Well, they didn't have that back then. Well, why would they even be referring to a South American snake? It doesn't make any sense. Just read it, Matt, and shut up. When two major assaults against the Confederate fortifications on May 19th and 22nd were repulsed with heavy casualties, Grant decided to besiege the city of Vicksburg beginning on May 25th, blah, 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 General Nathan P. Banks, July 9th. Down at the bottom, the Confederates surrender on July 4th. What is that what we've been celebrating? That's it. Is sometimes considered, combined with General Robert E. Lee's defeat at Gettysburg by Major General George Meade the previous day, the previous day, the war's turning point. That's what we've been celebrating. Now it all makes sense. Oh, look at this. Look, Mom, this has the same reality breakdowns as Gettysburg, which is a Mandela effect to some, and it should be. Guys, this isn't even a joke. This is a complete and utter reality breakdown. Not Nilk, you have derailed presenting this sort of history. Anybody with their head not completely up their ass should just walk away like George after telling a joke. I've seen enough. Reality's completely broken down. So let me get this straight. Major Battle of Vicksburg, one army brings 77,000 and 766 were killed. They tried to make the 77. Fromers tried to make it the same. 766 killed out of 77,000, at least in the vicinity or the army under the command of Grant. Each, each charge, of course, much less people. But this is ridiculous. There's no possible way, folks. That's less than a 1% chance of being killed. At Vicksburg, it's one of the major battles of the Civil War. So I'm just, I can picture it now. I think I did this the last time we did the reality breakdown video on Gettysburg. Some young man somewhere about to go off to war for the Union, call him a Zachariah Stoltzfus, say is going off. And mother, oh, I might never see my baby again. But you'll, oh, you'll see me again, mom. Don't you know the statistics on this war? There's less than a 1% chance of dying. What? I, I can't be right. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. That, that, not, imagine if your local lottery and your local bingo had those sorts of odds. You'd play it every day. 99% chance that I'll be coming home. Oh, uh, with those odds, it's more dangerous to milk the cows. Just like flying in an airplane, Mom, it's more dangerous to milk the cows than to wage war at Vicksburg. I'm no uh, math major. I'm no John Nash from Princeton. So let me get the calculator out here. So it's 766 killed divided by the total size of the army, 77,000, is 0.0099. 0.0099. The two decimal places, if it said 0.01, that would be 1%. Let's round it up to just 1%. 
oh, oh, nine in the thousands and the tens of thousands of places, you can round up to 1%. So an exact 1% chance of dying in Vicksburg. See what Kevin Costner did was no big deal, riding across that field, putting his arms out like Jesus, riding that horse. And it, that seemed courageous, co courageous like a death sentence. But there's only a 1% chance. Even if you throw yourself before the enemy, you're going to get killed. This is ridiculous. Not milk reality. You are breaking down. You have derailed, my friend. So let's check the historical record the best we can through paintings. You know, they didn't have no handheld camcorders back then. We have to go to paintings, but typically every major battle is covered in several different paintings or frescoes. I don't know the difference. But let's see if the statistics about 1% dead hold up. So here, this is the Union Army. I guess these are the, these are the Rebs, these Confederate sons of bitches coming over the hill here. But 1% chance of dying. So let's just see. He, he going to die. Oh, yeah, he going he to gonna die. Who else? Oh, this guy. Look, he got it in the eye. He going to die. He didn't get it in the right eye, did he? He going to die. Who this guy here, oh, he going to die. Oh, he, he dead already. Dead already. Gone. Oh, this guy here, he dead Jake Marley was, what you need to know before reading this Dickens novel is Marley was dead as a doornail before it starts. He, he gonna die. This guy's running right in. He gonna die. I mean, this, he gone, he dead. Okay, we're way above 1%. And this army here is way better fortified than these poor sons of bitches. Why? I don't, I don't even know why they put the gray coat on. They didn't have the cannons and the, what you call military infrastructure as these sons of bitches here. So the 1%, I bet if we did this on every painting about Vicksburg, the 1% dead wouldn't hold, but that's just me. We'll do uh, one more. A lot of close quarter fighting here at Vicksburg. I mean, I could understand there's only 1% chance to die. There's no medical treatment either. This guy is just, they're just feet away from each other. And this guy, he's giving up even trying to load. He's just stabbing. This guy here, he's already shot. Oh, this guy here, he already dead. He Jacob Marley. This guy, oh, look at this guy here. Oh, boy. Oh, look at this guy here. The 1% is not not holding. And see, this is, that looks like the start of when the armies came together. It would make sense that after five to 10 minutes, that 99% would still be alive. You'd have to be one of those people to question history. So let's return to the statistics just for a few minutes. I know the original purpose of the video is about these mausoleums and these gigantic structures and odes to themselves as to how great they were in life, this weird minion class. But this is more interesting right now. Got to finish up at least with this. Um, for the Confederate side, brought, of course, 33,000 roughly to the battle, 3,200, and it's combined, killed, wounded, and missing. So 3,200 is the number for all three combined, killed, wounded, and missing, 3,200. So there theoretically could be five people killed. Five killed, 3,195 wounded and missing. Hey, it doesn't say. It, we, so we assume 50-50. So we assume, what, about 1,500 killed at Vicksburg by the Confederates, bringing 33,000 people there? I don't think so. Not Nilk, you have D railed. What you're trying to present to the people is ridiculous, and you should be ashamed of yourself. Sorry, let's get back to the main point as to why I wanted to make this video. But when an appropriate reality breakdown appears before me, I think it's okay to chase it, especially when it's as weird as what we just saw. I mean, that by itself, there's nothing more you need to see about reality. It's like George telling a joke. He's like, I've seen enough. When they're trying to tell us that tiny little numbers were killed at Gettysburg, I mean, and then all of history, you can go into old books. It's not like they just changed the internet. Somebody's trying to tell me that, Matt, it's, anything can change on the internet. No, it's like a retrocausality or via Mandela effect. You can go into an old book, and that's what will be reflected in the old book. That's the characteristic of a Mandela effect or a retrocausal change in a fluid reality that's breaking down. Don't tell me it, anything can happen on the internet. I'm not an idiot. I know that. Sorry. Let's continue with what we were talking about initially. This is where it's not. This is not exactly where I stayed for the summer at the Taj Mahal. I had a room very high up with a very nice view, but I could come down here at night when I couldn't sleep. I like to sit amongst the bodies in the maus. There's a mausoleum at the bottom of the Taj Mahal. Of course, that giant structure 
was built uh, as a as a mausoleum for his love for whoever I don't know his I, I don't I don't know the name of the guy I'm sorry to, to show a lack of respect but uh, you know what I don't buy it I'm sorry I don't I don't buy it could even be constructed in the early 1600s you know this is my favorite topic of all time I mean 45 seconds or less old guard I, I won't keep going with this I know you've heard it thousands of times Matt we like it when you go I know but it's just it's I've said it too much. I'll do a video on this in a month or two. It's just too funny. Um, what is it? The Taj Mahal, 1630 or so, where the, I have to check the Wikipedia. I'm going to check it now just for fun. Originally, it said 25,000 artisans. <laughs> Matt, you've talked about this so many times. I can't help it. 25,000 artisans brought in. Well, where'd you get them? Where, where, where they just, like, I've said this, I know, a million times. Old, I know, I'm sorry, old guard. They're just laying around. In the countryside, 25,000 artisans, where'd you get them? Did you advertise on Indeed? Indeed is, a, is an internet job site, like the original was monster.com. Where'd you get them? <laughs> 25, and it changed to 20,000 artisans when I looked at it. I'm going to look at it right now to see what the number is. I'll be right back. Well, here it is on the Taj Mahal. It's roughly the same, but I think the bot that's heard me laugh at this for the last few years has been listening to me. It says it was 25,000 artisans to me three years ago. I remember it changed to 20,000, but the word workers to me is completely new. 20,000 workers and artisans brought in. It wouldn't be as funny. I mean, I, I, the word workers was not there. It was 20,000 artisans, 20, 25,000 artisans, tomato, tomato. What's the difference? I still would be laughing at it, but the way it's presented here is more legitimate. 20,000 workers and artisans. Oh, Matt, the skilled people, they only had to find about 15 in the area, and they knew where to go. It was not presented this way. I don't care what your... You go, oh, you going to go your way back machine? I don't care what the way back machine says. We see like retrocausal, uh, retrocausal changes, Mandela effects. It was 20,000 artisans, 25,000 artisans changed to 20,000 artisans. If it was always workers and artisans, I still would be laughing about it, but not to the same degree. I don't care what y'all way back research shows. Second paragraph, the Taj Mahal was designated, a, oh no, another one, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And it was labeled that in 1983. There's a very simple reality rule, guys, if anybody's new here. If UNESCO has put their slimy fingers on it and it's designated as a UNESCO, which is associated with the United Nations and those villains, if they put their little sign there, then it means the history presented is not real. It, there's, or there's something very wrong if UNESCO's in there. If you go to a site or a dig site or whatever, and you say, any UNESCO been in here? No UNESCO? Then what you find may actually be legitimate. Last sentence, the Taj Mahal is a major tourist attraction. Pooty Tang Award, and in the extreme, no kidding, and attracts more than 5 million visitors a year. In 2007, it was declared a winner of the New Seven Wonders of the World Initiative. The, the, what this makes no sense. <laughs> the, the wonders of the world, the, the whole point is it goes back millions of years or thousands of years. Or Victoria Falls, for example, millions of years. I think there are natural structures too, like Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. It's not just man-made structures. New seven wonders of the world. What would it mean, new? What was the pitch meeting for that? <laughs> Back in 2007, United Nations people getting together trying to prove their worth, trying to justify their existence to themselves as they look in the mirror, as they brush their teeth at night and somebody raised their hand. They, no one had been speaking for 30 minutes. Just they're just waiting to go to dinner. It's $5,000 a plate. Someone said, I know what we can do. And next year, let's do a new, a new seven wonders of the world. And then even the people at UNESCO and United Nations, those degenerates, they, they leaned forward with like a really nasty look on their face. They said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. The whole point of the seven wonders of the world is they're old structures that have been designated potentially 100 years ago. What's new that's going to change anything? And the guy leaned forward and he said, well, nothing. We'll just rename the exact same ones that we did before, but we'll make it look like a new research project, and then we can get new grants and funding from the United Nations. And that leads to $5,000 a plate dinners. And then everybody went, yay! We keep our, jo <laughs> we keep our jobs! Here's something almost nobody talks about. We never get a picture of the Taj Mahal from the sides or the back, do we? 
Now, I'm not saying it's fake first grade truth. Or it's not a styrofoam facade. That's what people would be claiming 10 years ago. There's nothing there, Matt. No, you, people have walked up to it with their 4K videos, and you can see that on YouTube, 4K walking tour, etc. But we always get this. Sh we, not only do we get we get not a lot of angles in terms of photographs of the Taj Mahal, we get the same exact photograph every single time. Somebody could walk up to take a picture and there should be somebody standing there and say, let me hand you this. You're just going to take the exact same photograph in the exact same place that everybody else does. Okay, I understand there's some sort of body of water on the other side or some sort of river or something, but n nobody can nobody can go uh, take their kayak out there and take a picture from the other side. Has anybody ever seen the backside? Maybe the backside is not done or something. And, the, and the, maybe that, who, they said, ah, fuck it. We'll just have the backside's open air like a, like a, a circus tent or something. I don't know. It's just strange, okay? I've never, let alone, I've never seen pictures from the sides, let alone the back. Maybe it's like Sanford and Son salvage in the back. It's just a total barrio piece of shit, and they try to cover that up the best they can. And somebody comes from the other side in that river, body of water, and they paddle up with a canoe. And the Indian authorities are like, they, they usher you away like somebody trying to approach Antarctica. Who knows? Don't you think it's odd? <laughs> There's, we've never seen a picture from the other side. Look, I'm, I know, I'm just being funny. We've got to close this out. I, I'm sure it exists. No, it's not a styrofoam facade and fake first grade truthers. But you know what, what I don't buy is the same story every time. It's a tomb. Remember, whenever the four hundred to five hundred thousand dollar a year salaried archaeology professors at the Ivy League in Cambridge and Oxford and the little liberal hellholes like Bard College and Bryn Mawr College, when they make their half a million dollars a year, they don't know what these things are. But secretly, they know. If you don't know, and this is one of the funniest things of all time to me, all you have to do is yell or cry out that it's a tomb. If you come across a gigantic structure, whether it be buried or above ground, if you don't know what it is and you don't want to look stupid, just say it's a tomb, a tomb for the dead. They say it every time and they're able to keep their jobs saying it. Thanks for listening.